Good morning. Could we uh, please stand this morning, please? Thank you so much. What a beautiful day, huh? Beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord. We're going to start off with, uh, you are my king, amazing love. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit lives within me because you died and rose again. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit lives within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be? Is you my king would die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. It is my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit lives within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Sorrow comes to steal 
feel the joy I when brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't a place to hide I am not a captive to the lies I'm not afraid to leave my past behind I won't be shaken no I won't be shaken cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your Awesome to be standing in God's love this morning. Hey, church, we're glad you're here. Extend some of that love to the folks around you. Say hello to them. Let them know you're glad to see them. Learn someone's name, perhaps. If you're joining us online, welcome. Let us know where you're worshiping from and say hello. Well, it's always a good week at Sharptown Church, and so we've had a tremendous week here at Sharptown. On Tuesday, we had a blood drive. We had 48 units of blood, which is just a trans, just wonderful that we can help so many people in that way. On Wednesday, we brought back our senior luncheon for the first time since COVID, and so this room was absolutely packed and full. We weren't sure how many folks were going to be here, but what a blessing to our community. Terry and Dave blessed us with music. It was just a wonderful day to be together. And then on Tuesday evening, we had our trunk retreat. We celebrated with our church families and with our community. It was just a fun time together. We have a video just to kind of show you what that was like, so enjoy this.
So that was just a neat way to invite folks out to our church and to bless folks and meet a whole bunch of families. So Sharptown Church, thanks for participating. You always go over the top. So that was a great night. Hey, we are in the middle of our Operation Christmas Child collection. And so you'll notice in your bulletin the items that we are to be bringing each and every week. If you have not brought anything yet and you would like to, there's a whole bunch of lists in there about what you could bring. This week coming up is small toys. And so that's the funnest to pack in the shoeboxes and the best to shop for. So take a look at that. And then we have some dates just to remind you of. And so on November the 12th, we're all going to be here together packing those thousand shoe boxes. Set aside that day on your calendar, 9 a.m. we're going to start. And then the week after that, so we pack all of our boxes. And then the week after that, we receive boxes from other churches and people all around our community. We call it processing those boxes. And so we're looking for volunteers willing to be here each day that week for a couple of hours. And then the week after that even, we're going to take a trip down to the processing center in Baltimore. More. And so if you would like to participate or help in any of those areas for the week that we receive boxes and for the Baltimore trip, we need folks to sign up. And so there are sign-up sheets out in the lobby so you can take a look at those dates and times and see when you might want to be here. It's a fun week as we receive boxes just to be together and to pray over boxes and to pray with people from other churches and our community. So take a look at those dates on the way out. See if you might be able to help with that. We are looking for some help with our senior high youth group. And so if you are interested in helping with senior high youth group, if you love high school students and are at least 22 years of age and love Jesus, we would love to plug you in. And so you can reach out to Erica directly if you would like to help in that area or if you have questions about that. Uh, one other thing to mention, we are having a trustee work day the same day as we're packing shoe boxes on November the 12th. It's important to get our church spruced up for the Thanksgiving and the Christmas season. So if you'd like to help in that way, we would love to invite you to do that. Janet English wanted us to let you know that if you are accustomed to getting offering envelopes, you'll want to make a note about that so she can go ahead and prepare and order those for next year. If you would like to give online and haven't set that up yet, reach out to the office. We would be glad to help you. That information is on our church website. And then as a reminder, we have Sunday school every Sunday at 9.30, I think. 8 to 9, 15, yeah, 9, 30 to 10, 30, Sunday school. So you're here, stay. We have uh, several wonderful options. If you're not accustomed to staying, it's okay if you miss the first couple weeks of any class. We'd love for you to just start and to be here today. It's a good time to be in fellowship together. And then as one last reminder, next week is daylight savings time. And so I think we gain an hour. I'm always confused, but thank goodness since church is now 8 a.m. that we gain an hour. So make note of that for next week and come to church on time. If you're here early, you can just hang out and wait. So we're glad to see you. We're going to invite our ushers to come forward at this time as we wait on you for our tithes and offerings. Hey, church, if you are privileged to be on Jen Mancini's offering side, she has one Eagles earring in and one Phillies. I mean, that's, that's just fantastic. Margie Roberts has flags on her car, same thing. And so I'm surprised I don't see a lot of you in Phillies shirts, but we're a little discouraged after last night, but they're going to come back. Let's pray. <laughs> Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We are so glad that we get to be here surrounded by your love this morning. God, as we pass the offering plates, it's an act of worship as we give to you what's a portion of yours anyway. God, would you continue to use what's put in these offering plates to make a difference for your kingdom? May your name be lifted high. May folks come to know and understand more about your love for them and the difference that you make in our lives. Jesus, we give joyfully. We give willingly. Continue to direct the steps and the paths of Sharptown Church, and we will be mindful to listen for your voice and to continue to be obedient. In your name we pray. Amen. Kids, you're dismissed to Graceland.
Who is this King of glory that pursues me with his love and haunts me with the cheering of a softly spoken word? My conscience of a reminder of forgiveness that I need. Who is this King of glory who offers it to me? Who is this King of angels? Oh, blessed Prince of Peace. Building things of heaven, all this mystery. My spirit of longing for its grace in which to stand. Who is the King of glory, Son of God and Son of Man? His name is Jesus, precious Jesus, Lord Almighty, King of my heart, King of glory. Who is this King of glory? With strength and majesty And wisdom beyond measure Oh gracious King of kings The Lord of earth and heaven The creator of all things My heart, heart, King of glory. The Lord of earth and heaven. Creator of all things, He is the King of glory. He's everything to me. His name is Jesus, precious Jesus, Lord Almighty. My heart, King of glory. His name is Jesus, precious Jesus, Lord Almighty. King of my heart, the King of glory. Is Jesus, mm, yeah, precious Jesus, Lord Almighty, King of my heart, King of glory, He's the King of glory, King of glory, precious Jesus. Lord Almighty, King of my heart, King of glory. Lord.
Lord, you're the King of glory. song speaks about Jesus you're not just a friend but you're my all in all as we sing this song think about everything Jesus has done for you in your life and will do for you in the years to come you are my strength when I am you are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus. My sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You were my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. bow with me in prayer. As we consider this morning your attributes and recognizing that you are an all-loving God, one who is holy one who is worthy of our praise. We run through the Rolodex or the thoughts, the lists of our minds about your attributes and your characteristics, recognizing that all good gifts come from you this morning, Lord. And we sit in your presence. We delight to be inside of this place this morning and in, with the people of God and with the psalmist, we would say this morning, we would rather be just a person who is a, a doorkeeper in your fold than to be anywhere else this morning. We delight to be inside of your presence. We would ask that your Holy Spirit will come today and help us. Remind us that we're not just here with the person that we rode with in the car we're not just here with the person who sits beside of us or in front of us, behind us, 
but we find ourselves delighted in your presence, that you're the one who is our unseen guest this morning, and all that we would do is for an audience of one, and we want to say thank you for being in our midst. You've promised that when two people get together, there's going to be three, that when there's a hundred, there's going to be a hundred and one, and so we recognize and consider your presence and invite you to continue to speak to our hearts Help us to have ears to hear and eyes to see what you want for us this morning. And because we recognize your presence here today and, and sing holy and sing worthy, we place the concerns of our life in your hands this morning also. And we would pray, Lord, that you'll come and, and meet us as we hand over, as we give to you the things that are in the forefront of our mind and the people whose concerns we bear inside of our mind. So we thank you for being here. Thank you for the privilege that's ours of worship. And thank you so much that we have a God who is concerned with the things that concern us. And we offer that back to you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as I was, uh, you know, watching the World Series and uh, the playoffs leading up to the series, and I watched uh, in the playoffs, uh, Schwarber hit that massive home run uh, in the Padres Stadium. As I was watching uh, as Harper blasts that, uh, you know, World Series, we're going to the series. That was an amazing situation as I watched a real Muto go ahead and, and win game one. I was wondering, I thought, you know, what, how amazing that must be to catch one of those home run balls. And then I thought, I wonder how many people at Sharptown Church have ever been to a sporting event, a professional sporting event, and have caught a home run ball or a foul ball. So that's the, that's the question of the morning, okay? Uh, just out of cure, my sheer curiosity, no one else's at that point. Anybody been to a professional sporting event, caught a foul ball, or caught a home run ball? Stick them up. Oh, a little higher than that. One, two. Uh, a few of you, that's good. Very, very good. That would, probably would include like a, uh, maybe even a football, I guess, if you're in the end zone, or a puck or something like that, you know? I think that maybe raises the... Uh, raises just expands that just a little bit, but I thought, man, how, how amazing that must have been, because uh, uh, having a chance to go ahead and be part of something like that, and so let's continue to cheer on the Phils. Three games in Philadelphia, I'm hoping this doesn't go back to Houston, you know, that's all I'm going to say, and uh, so going to be watching that. Uh, late nights, though, I got to tell you, whoo, you know, that makes for eight o'clock church pretty, uh, pretty early, pretty early. <clears throat> Uh, just a couple of things as far as review is concerned. I want to go ahead and back up if I could and, and remind you we've been thinking together about the aspect of expectations. We took the series title right from the classic novel and we have been considering together uh, God's expectations of us and even our expectations of God. We began by thinking together about how it is that God, from the very beginning, has conveyed His expectations to humanity. And maybe this is a new idea for you, or perhaps it's just a bit of a clarifying idea for you, that we said that God, He introduces Himself to us inside of the Old Testament with a word that's kind of familiar to us, but we're not quite sure exactly we have a good idea or definition, but he introduces himself to us in the means of covenant, in the means of covenant. And we have said that inside of Scripture, that covenant refers to a strong and a solemn agreement between two parties, a covenant. And so God uses this vehicle to introduce himself to us as well as for us then to understand what his expectations are of who we are as the people of God. And so covenant is a relational vehicle. I used to think probably a bit more around the idea that covenant had more to do with rule following 
and rule keeping, but that really isn't the dynamic at all inside of the Bible. The dynamic inside of the Bible is that a covenant is a relational dynamic between individuals as they have a relationship with one another, and it kind of sets the guardrails, if you will, around the relationship. We would use this term today, boundaries. It helps us with some of the boundaries, and so God has given to us a covenant. And you read this repeatedly inside of the Bible, and it sounds something like this, that in Leviticus, I will remember my covenant, I will remember the things that I am expecting to do. I will remember my promises to the people of God, and I will be their God. And then he says as well, this passage out of Jeremiah, that they will be my people because they will be part of a covenant arrangement and a covenant agreement. And so repeatedly, we run across these words inside of Scripture that have to do with expectation about what can we expect from this God that we are serving, and then two, what can God expect from us as far as relationship and in response. We mentioned then that there are two forms of covenant that we find inside of the Bible. Two forms of covenant. One has to do with when who is a higher authority has a relationship with a person who is a a lower authority. They're unequal, either in status or in power. And that is called a suzerainty covenant. This is the kind of covenant that God establishes with humanity. A suzerainty covenant. And one who is a king, we sang about it just a few moments ago. You are my king. And so as a result of that, as the one who is the king, you have given to us, you have provided for us your expectations about how then we can be part of your kingdom and how as a king we can expect you to respond. Last Sunday, we talked about a different kind of covenant. We talked about how in the midst of covenant that two people have the privilege of making agreements with one another, a covenant with one another. We said that this grows out of our understanding of covenant, that God has wed himself to us. God has wed himself to us, and he has committed himself to us, and that because God has wed himself to us and created that arrangement, created that covenant experience, He then has given to us the ability to wed ourselves to one another inside of a marital union. And we said last Sunday that inside of this understanding that God has first wed himself to us, that we also then have the privilege, a man and a woman, to experience a relationship that is the closest relationship in reality in human experience that mirrors that mirrors the understanding of who God is and so as a result of that just as we mentioned that God weds himself to us for our holiness Kristen is leading a class that says that this relationship of wedding ourselves to one another is not about our happiness But inside of that relationship, that covenant relationship, we understand then what it is to live lives that are holy with one another in relationship. That's the reason, as we closed last Sunday, we had a chance to share pictures of people who were wedded together, and their being wedded reminded us of the covenant arrangement that God, the one who is the creator, has wed himself to you and to me. And as a result of that, this intimacy, this relationship that we find inside of covenant has been established. This morning, we want to go ahead and take a look at an essential behavior that happens inside of a covenant relationship. There are plenty of places we can go for this, but I want to take a a snapshot, if I could, from the New Testament and specifically look at a passage that's found in Matthew 18. 
And so if you have your device this morning, or if you have a Bible and you'd like to follow along, I want to invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. <clears throat> These are very familiar words, uh, I would suspect for many of you, and as we have a chance to go ahead and look at the familiarity of them, oftentimes the temptation is that we are going to go ahead, I know this, I've heard this, I'm reminded of this, I already have checked this box off, and so uh, we then somehow kind of block out God's spirit from moving inside of our life for these next few moments. I would like to invite you not to do that today, and I want to invite you to think with me that in this relational dynamic that God has established with you and with me, that this is an essential behavior that God expects us to participate in, that God expects us to participate in. And so Peter came to Jesus and he said, Jesus, let me ask you, how many times, how many times should I forgive my brother or my sister against me? And so this morning, I'm going to go from preaching right into meddling inside of your behavior and inside of your life this morning. There's not anything that is more essential or more pertinent to our Christian experience than this dynamic of what God expects for people who are called by His name and how they are to respond to not only to other people, but also to the things that they have themselves done. And so we could look at forgiveness in a number of ways. We could look at God's forgiveness for humanity, which we will look at momentarily uh, for just a few minutes. We could look at what this dynamic looks like with one another, as Peter is asking here. We even could go ahead and perhaps take one more step psychologically about how it is that some of us have been involved in behaviors that we have yet to let go of and let God's grace do a work in our own hearts or lives about forgiveness. Peter is asking, how many times should I forgive? And when someone noticed the words, because this is essential for understanding what forgiveness is about, when someone sins against me, when someone has done something to me, when someone has somehow hurt me, how many times? Should I forgive seven? And the implication here is Peter's kind of thumping his chest thinking that if he is a person who is forgiven seven times, that would be something that Jesus would pat him on the back and say, absolutely, nice job, Peter. You only really need to do that once, but if you're going to do that seven, that's incredible. Jesus answered, uh, Peter, I want to tell you, not seven, but 77 times. Or, in another translation, seven, 70 times seven, 490 or 77 times, Jesus expands this understanding of forgiveness that, listen, Peter, I just want you to understand that I don't know that we ever get to the end of forgiveness. I don't know that we ever get to the end of forgiveness. That forgiveness, Peter, is not rooted in some things that you do, but it's rooted in my character, it's rooted in my nature, and when I give my character to you, when I give my nature to you, when I come to live inside of you, this expands dramatically. And so Jesus then tells a story to illustrate his point. And I love the fact that Jesus is not only a, an outstanding storyteller, but he kind of drops it right in Peter's lap. That's where I need that to happen inside of my life. The kingdom of heaven, if you want to be part of my covenant relationship, if you want to be part of this dynamic 
of living life with me. This is the expectation, says Jesus, that there is a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants, and he began the settlement, and a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. And since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children be taken to debtor's prison. Listen, uh, they've had an outstanding debt, 10,000 bags of gold for a really long time. It's time to collect the debt. And so now I'd like to ask you to bring him here. I want to go ahead and have this conversation with him. Let's go to the next slide. And as the servant came before the king, he fell on his knees and said, Will you please be patient with me? Now, 10,000 bags of gold is a remarkable sum. Uh, you would say today this is millions of dollars. And be patient with me and I'll pay you back everything. And the servant's master, the servant's master took pity on him and he canceled his debt. And he let him go. He canceled his debt and he let him go. We would use this terminology. He forgave the debt. You don't owe me anything. You don't owe me anything. Your wife doesn't owe me anything. Your children don't owe me anything. All is settled. You don't owe me anything. As a matter of fact, I'm going to release you, and I'm really not interested. I don't want to see you anymore. We don't have any more dealings, business dealings, your debt is forgiven. When the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 silver coins. Notice the disparity between the debt that was owed. And he grabbed him and he choked him and he said, Pay me back everything that you owe me. And he demanded that that happen immediately. His fellow servant fell on his knees, notice the language, and said the exact same thing. Be patient with me and I'll pay it all back. But the response was different. The response was different. Let's go to the next slide. It's one more slide. There we go. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay back the debt. The other servants saw what had happened about the disparity with how the master treated this servant and how the servant treated a person who was in an equal arrangement with. Notice, if you will, the implication. The master and the servant relationship becomes a covenant arrangement of one who has greater power to lesser. This one is a relationship of equal. But make no mistake about it, the implication is clear. The master called the servant in and said, You wicked servant, I canceled and forgave all of the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you also have had mercy upon the fellow servant just as I had mercy upon you? Because I acted this way towards you, shouldn't you act this way towards someone else? And then Jesus drops this right in Peter's lap. Right in the disciples' lap. Right in my lap. Right in your lap. And he says an astounding statement. This, this is how my heavenly father will treat you unless you forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. 
This is an essential behavior if you were to be a person who names the name of Jesus Christ and is a follower of Jesus. How essential? Well, this is replete inside of Scripture and becomes one of the very last words that Jesus even speaks. You remember these words. He's hanging upon the cross in his earthly body. He says, Father, would you forgive? Would you forgive? You remember, this is also part of the model prayer that Jesus taught. Will you forgive as we forgive? You recall that even inside of Jesus' teachings, that if anyone, anyone has anything against anybody before they come to the altar, they should care for that. I think to say that this is essential is uh, a great word and maybe even uh, an understatement because individuals who have been forgiven by God are people who forgive other people. Forgiven people forgive is the clear understanding inside of what Jesus wants us to hear and know inside of Scripture. <clears throat> Sarah Montana uh, was a victim of violence inside of her life. Her neighbor down the street was looking for items to sell, broke into her house, didn't see her brother who was asleep on the couch, recognizing as he had an arm full of computers that he was caught and uh, killed her brother. Later, he came back to see if the boy had died and the mom had come home and the neighbor had killed her mom and her brother. Sarah Montana, in a TED talk that she gave about forgiveness, began to wrestle with the idea about how as a victim of violence inside of her life and as a person that she had known and trusted and had broken that, fractured that, had perpetrated this crime, what did she do and how could she manage the emotions around that? She described that as she began to uh, work her way through this process, as she began to live in the midst of the court cases and being in court and the prosecution of this friend of hers who was her neighbor, she began to struggle with this idea of forgiveness. I want you to see some of the words from her talk that she gave as she was wrestling through this understanding of forgiveness. Let's go to the next slide. She said this, So how do you forgive effectively once and for all? She said the question started inside of her life and she began to run through and look at all the opportunities, all the information that is presented. She spent time online. She began to go ahead and work through this theological rabbit hole, she said. And, and she said her husband came home one day. My poor husband came home and I was frantic, she said. I was pacing back and forth in the apartment and spewing statistics about forgiveness. She turned to him and said, Do you know that there are 62 passages inside the Bible with the word forgive? That there are 27 with the word forgiveness? Let's go to the next slide. Not a single verse tells you how to do it. They just say how great it is. She said it's like Nike of the spiritual gifts. Just do it. And she said I was left inside of my life with no background in church, with not a lot of background in forgiveness. I was wondering since this 
is an endless five-star historical Yelp review. People say it's wonderful to forgive. The sales pitch is fantastic, but she said, I literally did not know what to do. That created a question in my mind. Many of us have grown up inside of the church, have sat in Sunday school, have been part of a small group. We've been in situations where we've heard messages, we've read Matthew 18, we know the Lord's Prayer, we've heard the admonitions around forgiveness. And I wonder this morning how many of us have the same sort of response as Sarah had that we know that it might be the right thing to do. We even kind of understand why it might be the right thing to do, but many of us are struggling with the how to do that. I want to just take a couple of moments quickly and tell you not only the why, but also a few steps that I've found helpful. And if you're in a small group this week, I think that you're going to see these steps and have a chance to revisit them with a bit more context and with a bit more information. The Bible reminds us as to the reason why. As to the reason why. And so inside of Scripture, in the book of Ephesians, we read these words. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Forgive as you've been forgiven. It's the story that Jesus told, just as the master forgave the servant, you be a person who forgives others as well. Just like Jesus forgave you. And then these words in Colossians, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy, beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against one another, forgive each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must forgive. This language inside the Bible prompted a man who was a psychologist named Lewis Smeeds to wrestle with the whole context of forgiveness and walk it through the pages of Scripture. Lewis Smeeds says that inside of the Bible, there is a pattern first that God gives to us and then invites us to be someone that embraces that pattern. Let's go to the next slide. He makes this observation in his book, The Art of Forgiving. He says this, that there are three really important movements, if you will, about how God illustrates forgiveness inside of the Bible. He makes the statement that the first is this, that God, he removes, he removes the obstacle that is the barrier to the relationship. He removes the barrier created by sin. And we know and you know, you don't have to be part of church long to understand that sin always separates us from God and it always is a barrier. And so as a result of that, we've said this a hundred times, sin always does this, it never brings you closer to God. And so God, He removes the barrier. Secondly, God surrenders the right to get even. Now that's an interesting concept when you think about that, that God surrenders the right to get even. Instead of getting even, he chooses to bear the cost in his own body. And so the Bible says this, that Christ absorbs the sin in his own physical body and dies for your salvation. And then God revises his feelings toward us and he looks at us as adopted sons and daughters. Forgive just as God has forgiven. Forgive 
just as Christ has forgiven. Forgive, he then is the pattern. And just like we thought about last week, that God, because he has wed himself to us, he's the one who establishes the covenant, he's the one who establishes the pattern, he never asks us to do something that he has not first done himself. And forgiveness is one of these essentials. And so how? How? Let me take the closing moments if I could and to walk you through something that we've talked about before. This may be more of a reminder for some of us today than it is an actual first glance at the how to. And I want to go ahead and just walk through with you this grew out of a relationship that I had with a pastoral counselor back in my undergrad by a guy named David Siemens. His son Steve grabbed his principles and concepts. Steve actually years ago was pastor at the Elmer United Methodist Church before he finished up his doctorate at Drew University and then went down to teach at Asbury College and Asbury Theological Seminary. He wrote a book called uh, Healing the Wounds uh, about how the cross of Jesus meets us in the midst of our woundedness. He spells out seven steps, and I am normally not a step person, do these three things, these five things, these seven things, but I think that this kind of helps work through and kind of illustrates or itemizes some things that become part of this essential for how to forgive. I want you to know that this is not a natural behavior. This is an unnatural behavior. In our fallenness, we would not forgive anyone. But in our redeemed state, the fact that God has done something inside of our heart, the fact that He has come to make residence inside of your life, and He shares His character and His nature with you, He said, listen, just as I've forgiven, I want you also to be people who forgive. So three things, first of all, about recognizing the aspect of our hurt, the aspect of our hurt or our pain. The first is to face the facts. Dr. Siemens goes on to say how important this is to begin to itemize this and to name these things for what they are. Sometimes we just do this with a broad brush and we paint with broad strokes. He said, no, no. This is important to go ahead and itemize and isolate circumstances inside of our own lives. And to feel the hurt. Understand the shame, the pain, the disappointment. Understand the shortcoming. Understand the circumstance that has opened up the wound inside of our life and then confront the feelings that go along with that area inside of our life. Regularly these three steps get kind of rolled up into one and we don't tweeze them out very well. I want to invite you this morning to think a bit more specifically and maybe kind of to tweeze these out inside of your own mind. Now Pause with me right here. It was inside of my relationship with David Siemens that he, as for the very first time, helped me understand that there are things that have happened in our past that have created aspects of pain and hurt and woundedness. He calls them infirmities. Infirmities. It's not his word, it's actually a word that comes out of a rich theological tradition from John Wesley. But here's the thing that was new for me. What was new for me is the fact that he made the statement that when we come to Jesus Christ and we ask him to forgive us of our sin and we ask him to make us new and the Bible says the old is passed away, that all things become new, Dr. Siemens says that there may be some areas of past abuse or past hurt or past infirmities 
that we still bear inside of our life that grace, we need a deeper work of grace to move inside of our lives. And sometimes this is a specific act of forgiveness towards the person who has been the one who has victimized you or me. After identifying these of feeling the hurt and confronting our hate, the reason there's a line there is because right there, right there, after we recognize that, it's the Sarah Montana description that she was walking around the apartment and she said, now what do I do after I've felt it, after I know it, after I've recognized it, now what do I do? And that's the reason there's the line. Because here is the decision about are we going to forgive or are we not going to forgive? Let me say that I don't think this is a one-time situation when the hurt, when the pain, when there is an infirmity inside of our life that is profound and continues its impact inside of who we are. Sometimes, again, this is the 70 times 7 forgiveness where we repeatedly revisit this because it kind of rears its head inside of our life and we continuously have to take it to Jesus. Bear the pain. That's a terrific statement because what that means is, and here is where the thing that kind of rises up in you and me it does not feel fair. It's, there's an inequity here. Surely they should pay because I've been paying. And I want to say to you, this understanding of justice, this understanding of hurt is something that God provides inside of our life. But let me share with you, here is the biblical dynamic of forgiveness just as Jesus was sinless and bore the pain of sin on the cross, the invitation is for you as his follower to do that and to absorb that somehow. And as you absorb that, the next step becomes the most important. And that is to release those who have wronged us. <clears throat> Philip Yancey reminds us inside of his book about grace that the Benedictine monks have maybe the best illustration that he's ever seen surrounding the idea of step five. And it has to do with something that every one of us, every one of us participate in every single week, every day. And it has to do with water. As a reminder of releasing those who have wronged us, Benedictine monks regularly during their worship time and devotions will have basins set up just like this. Because you see, when we want to go ahead and try to hold on to this situation, it's like we try to cut the water and hold on to the person who has wronged us and the pain surrounding that. He said, you know, if you let that go, and you release the person who's wronged us. You 
are doing just as Jesus has done. You are doing just as God has done. You are allowing everything to go ahead and let God care for the other person because understand that forgiveness is not about what they've done, it's about your response. That is the biblical model of forgiveness. And then, step six is learning to go ahead and live our lives without that pain, without that hurt, without that infirmity attached to our lives. Because you know as well as I do that sometimes, sometimes, we have permitted that to, to create our identity. And we don't know our identity at all without that attached to us. And the thing that makes biblical faith different than perhaps even a situation that you might encounter inside of some of the counseling books or the online things around forgiveness is this next step. And it is rooted and grounded in a God who has not holding our sin against us, but he wants a reconciled relationship and the possibility for reconciliation even to the person who has wronged us. Now, you know as well as I do that the significance of a topic like this that is all over the Bible, beginning at the very first pages of Genesis and runs all the way, is not an easy thing to do just in these few minutes. I do understand that I probably, and, and I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit to kind of raise questions in your heart and inside of your mind around what's going on in the midst of this. And, and here's the reason I can trust that this morning. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit, He's the paraclete. He comes along beside of us and He's our counselor. He helps us through these times. He helps us bear the pain. He helps us release those who have wronged us. This is an essential behavior in Christianity. So much so that Jesus said, I've given you this pattern so that you live out this pattern. You can have my character, you can have my nature, the things that I have done, you too can do. Now listen. <clears throat> it's a whole lot easier to stand up here and to walk you through seven steps than it is for you, for me, to actually do the things of forgiveness. For some of us, that takes months or even years or 70 times 7 revisiting this. But let me say confidently, there is enough grace in the cross of Jesus Christ to not only help you get there, but to give you victory. Amen. You stand up with me. One last thing. And then we have to go. <clears throat> Doug, I hear what you're saying. I understand the Bible ethic. I recognize that God can give me and he expects these things of me inside. Of, but I have to tell you, you don't know the situation inside of my life. And I am not willing. And I am not willing to do that. 
And so listen, this morning, all over the auditorium, here's what I would like to invite you to pray. Lord, would you make me willing to be willing? Are you with me? Are you, would you make me willing to be willing? Because listen, that might be the very first step for some of us. I'm willing. I think I'm willing. And then for some of us this morning, you already have hold of somebody, something, a situation, and I just want to listen, invite you to uh, let that go. And so will you place your hands in front of you like we've done so many times before, cup them this morning just as we've seen, as we've kind of illustrated, and will you pause with me and let's pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you for the biblical model, for the essential behavior that you expect us when we're called by your name to be people who reflect your character and your nature in how we treat one another and even the relationship we have for many of us with ourselves. And we confess to you all across our auditorium this morning, we want to be willing to be people who forgive and are called by your name. Will you help us to be willing? That by our very nature, we just are grudge holders. By our very nature, we hold the pain and we hold other people because it just doesn't seem fair to let them go or release them. This morning, Lord, we would pray that just like we would open our hands and let water move down through our fingers. We would pray today that many people would receive victory today and let go of things that they've been holding on inside of their life, instances that have created infirmity and pain. And Lord, we commit ourselves to the 70 times 7 ethic that we are never going to be beyond a place where this is not a mandate for our lives. So go with us this morning. Help us even to act this out in our own marriages, in our own families, in our own homes, in our neighborhoods, in our workplace, so that people might see the Christ that's living in us. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Go in peace. <clears throat>